Hello everyone, welcome to an all new episode of the Indic Explorer show. This is your host Vineet. And please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to the channel. So the topic of today's podcast, uh, LGBTQ and Dharma. Now, in the Western world, there has been a lot of activism in the space of LGBTQ rights uh, for people who belong to these communities uh, who have, you know, who are what you would call sexual minorities. Uh, there's been a lot of activism that has happened. Uh, this episode is a way to kind of explore what is the situation for the LGBTQ community in India and especially from the prism and lens of Sanatan Dharma because, of course, Hinduism is a deep rooted cultural influence in every sphere of life in India. So it makes sense to look at it from a cultural perspective. And uh, to delve deeper into this discussion, I have a very special guest today with me, Ankit Bhuktani. The Indic Library is an initiative to bring all the Indic subjects together in the form of a database and create a searchable and referable repository. It's also a community of people who talk and research about subjects with regards to Indic culture. Ankit is also part of this group. So guys, I would suggest that you also join this community. Namaste Ankit, welcome to the show. Namaste, thank you so much for having me. It's such a great pleasure to be with you. So Ankit, amongst other things, he is one of the well-known activists in the United Nations. He works there uh, on... Uh, LGBTQ rights. So he's been a very uh, well-known speaker. He's also been a TEDx speaker. So Ankit, as uh, you are gay, right? And also a practicing Hindu, a Sanatani, a proud one at that. So uh, how did Sanatan Dharma shape your experiences, uh, you know, in terms of lived experience? Because that is such an important thing in Hinduism, right? So, uh, as someone who is gay and a Hindu, uh, do you think those two things are equally important? How do those two identities shape you as a person? Uh, well, to answer this question, there are two parts to it. First, you ask me about my personal lived experience and then does being queer and uh, being Sanatani go hand in hand, right? Uh, so to answer the first section of your question, uh, I had so many questions about myself growing up as queer kid, as gay kid. I come from a lower middle class Gujarati family, born in Dombivili, which is the satellite city of Mumbai. Uh, studied in Gujarati medium school till my 10th grade. My world was limited to my school back home and again coming back, going back to the school. Uh, so I had no idea about the what is happening in the back bench. Just forget about having access to global conversations and un having various conversations around diverse gender identity, orientation and expressions. All of the things were never part of my lived experience. However, when I look back at my life, I remember having natural attraction towards men, just the way other people in my class, uh, especially boys, had interest towards girls. Uh, however, at that time, I had no terminology for it. When I reached my college age, I discovered these terminologies and, and I, I remember uh, somebody making fun of me and using the word gay for the first time. And to my surprise, uh, I went to college library to find out the meaning of this term. And that is when I discovered the meaning of term gay. And then it was written to one was homosexual and second was happy. And I said, hey, maybe I'm both. Uh, jokes apart. Uh, when I look back at my life, although I had no idea that what does term gay stands for, I always had attraction towards men. Um, whether it was watching Shaktiman in the form of Gangadhar, because in the form of Gangadhar he used to meditate shirtless, and because his all Kundalinis were shown in that time, or watch uh, or the Savariya song uh, of Ranbir Kapoor. I think it's sort of his first movie in which again he was shown shirtless. So all those movements were quite special to me. And what does that special mean? I had no idea at that time. And as I was discovering myself, language, terminology, understanding of this experience was not there. Then when I discovered myself being different and I got a terminology for it, 
I also got to learn that hey, this is not something which is generally accepted in society. Especially, it is something which is not uh, celebrated. It is not something uh, which people would be fine with it. On contrary, people will look, look down upon this. Uh, and uh, that is when I started discovering uh, uh, too many questions coming in my mind. That what should I do next? Should I try to change? Why am I like this? Is there any way to come out of this? And above all, uh, does my religion accept me or not? Does my faith accept me or not? Because uh, religion uh, had played a very critical role in my upbringing. Uh, I come from a, I'm not say completely uh, religious, but uh, uh, I have seen my mother, my nanny, my uh, uh, family members regularly worshipping Lord Krishna within the bhakti tradition, bhakti movement. And uh, anything which happens at home, we said, okay, Thakurji ka marzi, uh, you know, Krishna's wish. Uh, whenever we go out of home, we offer pranams to our home deity, uh, Thakurji. We, we go to the temples of Krishna around the country and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so on an and on addition to that, one advantage I had because I studied in Gujarati medium school, I had direct access to the Indian literature, right? I had not had to depend on the English translation of Indic religion. And unfortunately, again, I see that many times children who studied in English medium, they generally do not have interest, uh, natural interest towards reading Indian scriptures when they're in school age, wherein I, uh, A, I had interest in it and also because of the language accessibility, I could easily read uh, Hindi, uh, English, Marathi, Gujarati, translations of Sanskrit language uh, text, which is very close to Sanskrit than English. So I studied uh, Bhagavad Gita for the first time when I was, I remember, in my fifth grade. Of course, I did not understand most part of it when I read it for the first time. But uh, Indian scriptures and, and Sanatan uh, uh, understanding of worldview had always been there in my lived experience. And that's why when I discovered myself being different, being queer, I had to find out the answers. Now I'm talking like uh, 20 years ago. At that time, uh, there were no readily available answers uh, to these questions that uh, does Hinduism accept squareness? Uh, and of course, at that time, internet was not so popular. Uh, there were no readily available textbooks or, or conversation, even no Gurujis and, and Acharyas were openly talking about it. Uh, so I had to find my own answers. And when I started doing my own research, I found few things. And now I come to the second part of the answer. And that is how my being queer and me being Sanatani go hand in hand. And that is, that is when I discovered that hey, Hinduism essentially, in my limited understanding, in my limited darshan, is about inclusion. Inclusion of what? Inclusion of diversity. If you see Sanatan Dharma, there is so much of diversity. There are diverse deities, diverse acharyas, diverse paramparas, diverse sampradayas, and different, different way to approach the same divinity. Dvaitavad, Dvaitavad, Shuddha Dvaitavad, Dvaita Dvaitavad, and so many ways to look at the same deity and that is what the beauty of sanatan is essentially it is about diversity yet all of this fall under a beautiful umbrella called sanatan parampara so it is diversity and inclusion this is the land we celebrate of vishwanath which is in kashi and jagannath in puri and both of them literal translation of vishwanath or jagannath is the lord of the universe when we say lord of the universe it includes everyone and this is what the understanding i got of course we will talk more as we go in the conversation about from the queer understanding of sanatan parampara but essentially it is about diversity and inclusion and because sanatan talks about diversity and inclusion for millennia i find myself so comfortable to be proud queer at the same time to be be proud sanatani uh, very interesting there but uh, just delving deeper into the point you made uh, about hinduism and you know how how do you reconcile dharma with lgbtq like uh, from the perspective of texts from the perspective of artwork in temples 
of which we know there are multiple representations so how do you see a uh, hindu philosophical thought how do you think it saw this historically speaking uh, uh you know people from the sexual minorities how how did they actually perceive it both in terms of text as well as lived experience so let me answer the text first Uh, and before even going to the text, let's understand the theology part of it, or, or a, a critical understanding of uh, the uh, the technical aspects of Sanatan Parampara. And that is, Sanatan Parampara says, and not just Sanatan Parampara, uh, even uh, uh, let's say other paramparas which are born out of India primarily believes in the law of karma, right? The law of karma gives the space for the rebirth. and what is being rebirthed is the soul atman so when we talk about sanatan we are primarily talking about the atman's journey in the material world and with its own effort and the grace of a guru and uh, uh, the god we go back to from on our original position after being enlightened or awakened or whichever terminologies we prefer to use based on our respective sampradaya now what is the gender of the atman atman is gender beyond i'm not saying gender neutral okay that means different thing i'm saying gender beyond and that's why when we talk about vivaha we say that it is the it is it is the merge of the two atmans we don't say from the parapara i mean that's even the regular conversation right vivaha to do atma ho ka milan in a regular conversation that when that means we are saying that two atmans which is an atmans are gender beyond there are n number of texts which talks about atman being gender beyond uh, especially in bhagavad gita uh, we can find references to the con- concept of atman and atman is does not have body does not cannot be cut through fire uh, uh, burn through fire cut through any weapon and so on and so forth also it doesn't have any uh, gender identity it is just like a cloth today i'm wearing this cloth i drop this cloth tonight tomorrow morning i'll wear some other clothes right that is what we talk about from the technical understanding so when atman is gender beyond my real original uh, core identity does not have a gender it is just the an external expression of my atman within this material realm which we talk about uh, Uh, has a body and this when we say when we have a body then it counts with bodily characteristic gender is one among them there are so many other characteristics to the body uh, sankhya darshan goes much in detail about uh, uh, like you know which talks about uh, uh, man chitta buddhi ahankar uh, panch panch gyanendriya panch karmendriya so on and so forth but essentially we all are atman and atman is gender beyond point number 1 Point number two. That means we can say that in today this birth, I can have a male body. In next birth, I can have a female body. Or I may have a female body in the previous birth. I can have a male body. Point number two. Point number three. This body right now, uh, my is based on my karma, based on the previous body. I am getting this birth right now because I had some karma which I need to address. which i have done in my past life and past past lives as well all right uh, i have given this body so for whatever reason my bodily conditions of this time whatever is my uh, prarabdh uh, right now is based on collection of the past lives all the karmas together which can manifest in some kind of bodily situations bodily conditioning which may be different than others that means i might be queer based on my karma of previous life just the way whatever your situation right now may be is based on the karma of previous life so this is the critical understanding theological understanding of uh, why we are queer uh from a point of view of the technical understanding of sanatan dharma that we are atman it's not about just one life it's about the lifetimes after lifetimes and we whatever we are right now is based on the previous karmas what are the karmas we don't know uh but that is the answer now 
let's look at the various scriptures and how it deals with it. So we find that n number of scriptures, all the way you uh, go to say Brahm, uh, Charaka Samhita or Narada Smriti or the uh, oldest Sanskrit dic uh, dictionary called as Sanskrit Shal Shabda Kalpa Druma. All of this mentions some or other kind of queerness. And when I say the word queer, which is an English word, but a better Sanskrit word for this would be Tritiya Prakriti. I'm not saying third gender, but I'm saying third nature. So the nature here I'm dividing into one is the male nature, female nature, and third nature. Tritiya Prakriti. Now, wonder this. There are different sections or types of queer or Tritya Prakriti people have been mentioned. And I'll not go much into detail of it because otherwise it will become a very academic approach. And this is not a theology class, but we are just having a conversation. But primarily, let's understand that our medical texts such as Charaka Sabhita, uh, some of the other, uh, like, you know, uh, sociology texts, such as Smritis, talk about uh, a different type of people who may have a different set of orientation and expression uh, and different set of general identities. And above all, when we look at the Puranas, our Puranas are full with n number of examples which does not fit the traditional understanding of binary genders. So here we are saying that are they Purush? Are they Shtri or are they Napunsaka? But the word Napunsaka is not a derogatory term in the scriptures. I mean, today if we say that Napunsaka means somebody who is uh, not men enough, but Napunsaka, it just means this, is he a man? Question mark. That's it, right? So we find that different, uh, uh, like, you know, connotations of Napunsaka within the Puranic traditions. And let me take this one step further in which many of your audience would be aware that within the Puranas, we get so many stories. Very famous ones are of Shikhandini. Another one is the depiction of uh, Ardhanarishwara and so on and so forth, right? So we see that from the uh, religious technical understanding from Atman to the Puranic times and the Puranic stories, everywhere, every now and then, we are questioning ourselves that is the world only between men and women or are there people who do not fit in the stereotype categories of men and women? Our rishis who wrote that had a courage to acknowledge the different set of diversity of humanities existed during that time and found it worthy to mention and record in our scriptures to whom we worship today. Uh that's a very interesting take, especially the fact where you mentioned Prakriti nature. And uh, I mean, it's in a way I find that as a very non-judgmental and, you know, when you say it's nature, it's natural, it's naturally occurring. It's very life affirming, right? I mean, it's the whole lens of looking at it completely changes from the conventional way of looking at it. So I, I think just the terminology in this case just presents a completely different picture. So uh, you have been uh, an activist on LGBTQ issues and you've also spoken from the Dharmic perspective. So how do you think Dharmic advocacy of this issue, firstly, what does it offer differently from the mainstream uh, activism on this uh, in, in this field? And how different is it? And, you know, what's the approach like? Uh, so my understanding of activism, and uh, when I call myself activist, although that is not the terminology I have given to myself, it is the people started calling me activist and it is easy to communicate about your identity rather than saying that, hey, you fight, you really uh, like, you know, advocate for this cause and things like that. Otherwise, it will become something in three, four sentences. That's why I also accepted the term activist. However, my understanding of activism is very different than the general understanding of activism. The general understanding of activism is somebody who will do narebaji, who will do protest, who will fight somebody in the power, 
you need to ask the difficult question to people in power of positions and so on and so forth, right? My activism is not like that. I believe not in the activism of hate, but I believe in activism of care, acceptance and love. When I say care, acceptance and love, is I want to have some and not we other. I am here for a conversation and a dialogue. So I am open to have a conversation and understand the other side of point of view and then try to find a way in which both of their truth can coexist. This is what my Sanatan teaches me. So uh, when I say myself an activist, I am not somebody who will say that the world is binary. There is an oppressor and there is an oppressed. And I need to be the self-proclaimed voice of oppressed to fight this oppressor. Because my Sanatan knows that the one who is oppressed right now will be the oppressor tomorrow. And the one who is oppressor right now will be oppressed tomorrow. Right? So the, the, the life goes on into circle. And that is what Sanatan teaches me. So I don't have much tension. I don't have much of a what would happen. No, there is no day of judgment, at least in my understanding, in my lived experience or in my worldview. Because everything goes on in cyclical. What I can do is make life better for me and people around me as far as I it is possible in my limited capacity. So my activism does not derive from the binary worldview of somebody who is oppressed and oppressor, but my world activism derives from the worldview that it is important to have a dialogue and with the dialogue leads to a social change. Point number one. Point number two is that there are so many people who have done wonderful work in India and around the world on LGBT rights in the courts and outside the courts, right? And because of their work, and I need to acknowledge that, right? That they, because of their work, India has finally got rid of IPC 377, which was a British era law criminalizing homosexuality in India. But will the change in law would be enough to bring a change in the society? That is a question to like you know think upon. Then who are those channels who will bring the change to the law and translate that change in a law and change in the society? That attitude and which is the language they are going to use so when we go to the society in general and say that hey you are wrong my gender pronouns are like this you need to call me like this and then if you don't do that you are a, a bigoted you are a, 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 like you know some abada narrow-minded fascist person the society will not accept you you need to use the language the person understands. So I use the religion as a language to communicate my message of inclusion. I may use the family values, traditional family values as a, as a medium to communicate my message. Or I may use the language of science. I may use the language of love. So these are the different like you know, channels I utilize. Religion can be one of it. Tradition can be another one. Our lived experience can be the third one and so on and so forth. But I never use the language of hate and binary worldview, which makes somebody a victim and some else, somebody else a villain. Because I know there is no one, nobody is a victim and nobody else is a villain. I think you raised some very valid points there. And I, because when people are spoken to in a cultural grammar, I'm not just saying linguistic, but the cultural grammar that they understand. It's surprising how much people are able to accept things we would think that they can't because they are communicated to in a way that is in their worldview, right? Rather than push them in a corner and then say, you have to do this. This is the way it has to be. So, I mean, uh, I, I want to ask, like, for example, something like pronouns. Now, this has become very prevalent in the Western world, especially, right? whether you're straight or whether you're from a sexual minority pronouns is something that you have to use and uh, also i mean other forms of protest like pride parades what what do you think about uh, you know these kind of what you would call revolutionary activism uh, within the lgbtq community how do you see these things let me answer the pronouns one first okay 
I generally use pronouns next to my name for the simple reason that it gives a message to the people that the gender is not binary. There can be somebody who is identifying themselves as male. There can be, which I am, I'm a cisgender male. I identify myself as a male. There can be somebody who is female and there can be somebody who does not identify with any of this gender. At least does not identify with the binary gender. Right? So that is the message I give. Uh, that's why I deliberately use the my pronouns next to my name in most of my work emails or even during this conversation right now, you can find my gender pronouns next to my name. However, I do not force the gender pronouns on somebody else. That is not my way of approaching. I will explain them that it's better to use your preferred gender pronouns if you are comfortable. But if you don't, that is your choice as well. It is your freedom as well. Nobody should be forced into doing something they don't believe in. Because by not having gender pronouns, I don't Right? Sorry, I was just... Uh, unparliamentary language has been used suddenly right now. But uh, right, I don't have a gender You use the gender pronouns or not, it doesn't matter. Because is my identity so weak that it can be shaken up? By you not calling me with my preferred gender pronouns. And if yes, I need to reflect on my identity. So that is that is first thing. Now to, to uh, talk about uh, the pride parade. Look, pride has its own significance. When I discovered myself being different, I had nobody to look towards. I had no idea that there can be people like me in the world which exist. I need to say that over 95% of queer people when they discover themselves being different, think that they are the only one in the whole world who is different. That there is something defective piece. Right? And that that time, that may lead to depression, to even committing suicide. So for them to find some kind of uh, commonality with somebody, to somebody with relate with, pride plays an important role because it played an important role in my life from my lived experience. I happened to learn that there is a Mumbai Pride Parade which is happening. Uh, so I, I embarked, I traveled all the way from Dombivali to the Pride venue where it was happening in 2009. Very first Mumbai Pride gathering which was happening in Matunga. I took a train, local train, alone for the first time in my life. Got down at Matunga and I decided I will not join with those people. Yet it was those people. And I stood from a distance and I observed them. And then what did I see? I see that people in, in uh, colorful clothes dancing and celebrating something. And I, I questioned myself that, hey, if they can celebrate, if I not celebrate, at least can I accept myself? And that gave me courage that I'm not alone in the world. And there can be a life in which I can be just uh, uh, normal and regular as they all are, as all other humans are in my uh, people around me. So pride has its important role. What the challenge comes in is that in the name of intersectionality, we bring in so many non-queer agenda within the queer pride, right? And that's, that is when we see that there's so much of left dominance of the pride spaces, unfortunately. So in the last few years, especially after 2014, all kind of anti-India uh, uh, sloganings, uh, mobilizing and chanting which take place which is unfortunate. We have seen uh, like, you know, pride being used during the time of CANRC extensively to propagate some conversation which was nothing to do with uh, LGBT rights per se. Or to the extent we have seen, unfortunately, uh, in Mumbai, uh, pride itself, wherein I myself was present, uh, make a case that... Uh, uh, allegedly, India should be broken into pieces and North East should be declared a separate country by itself. So, questioning the national integrity and territorial integrity of our country. Uh, these are the events which makes me uncomfortable, which makes me really question that are the pride really for queer rights or something else? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the custodians of pride Unfortunately, the custodians of LGBT rights around the world and in India are coming from a certain political ideology which does not have space 
only for people who wants to talk about queer rights at queer spaces you know i uh this something that i've always kind of thought about when we say lgbtq uh and we put all of it in one zone uh somewhere i felt that the problems of trans people uh in some ways are far more acute uh their challenges are very different right we understand that they are all sexual minorities but uh you would still find a lot of uh same like people who are either lesbians or gay around you or even bisexual they would be in spaces around you in the shop in the grocery store or in the workplace you know people you know you might still find them but trans people it's a different situation altogether you just don't find them in all the spaces around you and a lot of them are actually living in very terrible conditions right it's they actually are truly secluded in some ways i would say they are there in and around in some places but they are not there in all spaces so the problem with trans people somehow you know is a lot more complex and uh, what what do you think about that look it's about who can hide their identity and who can not so most of the queer people uh, especially from lgb uh, when we were in schools because most of us happened to be cisgender person by cisgender person that means that our biological sex and our gender identity what we consider ourselves happens to be same uh, we can merge or we can mix ourselves with other kids in the school and uh, so that's why it becomes easy for us to hide our identity especially when we want to complete our education the moment our gender identity cannot be hidden and that is when the bullying starts and unfortunately this bullying is not only done by the peers in the classroom but at times even teachers are involved in that so they would be treated differently uh, so somebody somebody who's effeminate effeminate boy or some someone who is a very uh, uh, like you know masculine girl so our classmates will make fun of them you know sometimes your teachers will make fun of them uh, uh, this this uh, kids sometime come home try their mother's clothes or brother's clothes and again if a female uh, girl child is trying a brother's clothes or dad's clothes it's still perfectly fine right because oh hame to beta hi chahiye tha so many times we see that uh, girls being raised as the boys but if it is a boy who tries out sister's clothes or girl's clothes and things like that uh, just to check out how they look and they are just exploring they are just discovering their self being different and not being comfortable with the bodily identity they are being given by the society and if they are caught by family they are been ridiculed uh, sometimes they are taken to medical professionals if they are taken to proper medical professionals still okay because then they will tell you that hey there is nothing wrong with your kid uh, you can't change it but sometimes they were taken to Uh, like you know, some kind of uh, uh, black magic people, and so on and so forth, uh, and then this becomes so difficult that uh, many times they are dropped out of education system. Many times they are thrown out of their home, and they come to street. Now, what is there on the street? Survival on the street is so difficult. So what happens is that uneducated trans person living on the street. has only two option for the survival and one is to beg and second is to sell their body and both of them are a very exploited way of earning livelihood and that's why you find that the within the lgbt umbrella the t the trans people are the most marginalized are the most deprived from any kind of resources and that's why there needs to be a special attention to it how many of us are comfortable giving employment to a trans person forget about doing anything else can you hire a trans person as a house help will you be comfortable will your society be comfortable in the society you live in how many of you would be comfortable uh, if a trans person happens to be a nanny Or, or taking care of your uh, like you know uh, small ones at home or on your pets taking out in the evening for a walk and things like that will the in the park they are going 
will the people in the park would be comfortable with it right these are the real hard eating questions we need to ask and when we find answers to that we know that why trans people are most marginalized within the lgbt community yeah that's that's very true and uh, from the from a larger perspective from a policy perspective uh, what do you see the future shaping out to be in terms of uh, i know it's been decriminalized but from the perspective of marriage versus civil unions uh, adoption rights you know going to the next step where do you see that uh, shaping up going forward also inheritance rights i know that up for example has given trans people inheritance rights and i think there's if i'm not wrong there's an educational institution also but uh, where do you see these issues shaping up for the future for the whole country look i think uh, india has embarked on a journey of queer acceptance and we are not going to look back irrespective of who comes in the power at the center uh, irrespective of uh, whatever the conversation happens within the community uh, the way we have seen the progress and growth of indian lgbt rights in past eight to nine years to 10 years we have never seen like that before uh correct so i am very optimistic person i see that in my lifetime at least there would be marriage equality we will be will we call it civil partnership will we call it marriage we will call it something else i do not know but some kind of civil union legally recognized civil union by the state of same gender uh, folks would be there in india at least in my lifetime if not adoption rights point number 1 point number 2 um there is a dire need for an anti discrimination act uh, for queer people so that queer people are not discriminated based on their gender identity orientation and expression at any place uh, whether it's at workplace whether it is in the uh, market or anywhere else in the world uh, so that is something we need to look towards and uh, third thing is in my um like a you know, strategic approach towards this whole debate on marriage i think that it is better to avoid the term marriage and call it civil partnership because it's quicker way to get what we really want uh, by using the word marriage we involve the religious authorities and and the cultural understanding and and uh, emotions uh, comes with it that becomes much more complex messy and tricky rather than we say that hey, marriage is between men and women you keep that institute we don't want it all we want is the legally recognized partnership hence why we call it a civil partnership and on top of it you do your own fera na saath fera with pandit ji to anyway happening just three days ago there was this gay wedding which happened in lonawala uh, i put the beautiful video of it on my twitter uh, channel right? so that is not a crime so nobody is stopping you to get married with all your riti rivaj of whichever religion you want to have so but uh, yeah i mean we find that uh, so many gay weddings from hindu tradition being happening in uh, across the country this is not no more a foreign concept uh, so you can do that in your privacy uh, with people around you who love you and support you at the same time you call it civil partnership publicly from in the eyes of law that is a, that is a much better way to go so from the way you're saying it if even if you use different words like union or partnership as long as it has all other legal benefits and protections of a marriage even if you don't use the word marriage you're fine am i getting it right correctly because why are we asking for marriage it is not just for the emotion that oh i'm married to this man no it is about the the rights uh, which you heterosexual state which you might have taken it for granted right for an example if i'm married to another person uh so if i'm not married to another person then i am have to live with him for 30 years of my life and by some reason i exp- uh, like you know i leave my body uh without making a will my whole property will go to some blood relation uh, wala cousin which i might have not even seen for years and not to my partner with whom i have shared my whole life or if i'm unconscious in hospital uh and if my pa- my family is around uh my parents can have raise an objection uh, of my partner being there and the hospital will ask my partner to leave because there is no legal relation between me and him and i'll be unconscious to make the decision that who gets to be there or to my uh, uh, last rights or, or things like that right 
So along with that, I don't have ability to open a joint bank account as partner, have a insurance uh, or joint bank loan or all this civil rights which comes with this partnership, legal uh, partnership, which are we deprived of, we will get all of that. So civil partnership, which includes all the civil rights of partnership is what we should demand for. And what about adoption rights? Uh, to be very honest, I'm uh, like, you know, I'm in the, in the phase of uh, discovering more on that. So there's one emotional side of me uh, at the age of 30 now, uh, desires to adopt a kid. There are so many kids who do not have parents uh, that the child may get a home, a loving parent. Uh, and in a brighter future than being in an orphanage. Uh, so I would love to adopt a baby girl and then raise her as my own. At the same time, uh, there are people who say that uh, children really require male and a female in their life as parents and not two same gender. And it may have a negative impact on their psychology. Uh, there are scientific research on both the side of argument. Um, I happen to know few children who have a queer parents, of course, not in India, but uh, abroad, uh, who are completely comfortable. I know two parents uh, in India who have adopted the children. However, the children are in school age right now. Uh, one is a lesbian couple in Mumbai, I know, uh, and another one is a gay couple in Delhi. Uh, the lesbian couple in Mumbai has a son who is, I think, in ninth, eighth or ninth grade right now. And a couple, gay couple in Delhi has two beautiful sons. They both are in school right now. Um, and uh, they are completely fine. They are having a happy, normal life. Uh, but yet, I'm yet not sure that uh, can queer people adopt children? And should queer people be allowed to adopt children? I'm yet to make my mind. Okay. And... Uh... There's one important issue, I think, in this subject, which is often unexplored or underexplored, which is family acceptance. A larger society, friends, etc., control karna mushkil hai because the variables in the outside world, you don't know because there are so many and how many people will you change. But home, that is an area that there is greater possibility to you know, to change mindsets because these are your people, your blood, right? So do you think, and somewhere I sense talking to a lot of my friends who also who, you know, are either lesbians or gays that family acceptance na hona sometimes leads, you know, them into the path of such activism, destructive activism. In places where there is family acceptance, I have pretty much, I mean, it's almost 100% of the cases that I've seen. Uh, they don't really veer into, you know, the destructive path. They actually are very like, you know, I, I know people who are very dharmically inclined and that that reason for that is that their family was accepting. What do you think about this? What has been your experience on this? Yes, so your um, theory is uh, like, you know, almost correct. And uh, even in my experience, and I happen to know uh, countless queer people in India, uh, within the activism space and outside activism space, uh, within the activism space, people who are into this kind of toxic uh, uh, activism uh, and people who are not so toxic you know, and who fight for the queer rights. And in 99% of the cases who are uh, such kind of toxic activist who just want to break the whole world uh, and they think that only their way is the right way, did not find acceptance at their home, uh, did not find love uh, and, and uh, warmth uh, by their family members. And then when you get rejected by the people whom you love, the only people who are there to readily accept you just the way you are happens to be uh, the queer people uh, you meet in the pride, in the events, in the college campuses, and what is which is the most dominant voice within this uh, queer spaces is of this destructive queer activism. 
and that's why when you try to fit in within those spaces who because that is the only space you are being accepted you told that line and over a period of time you will start believing in what they are believing in yeah that's true what do you think about uh sex change operations the use of hormone blockers uh what what is your take on these like subjects in terms of how you know they should be used and in what kind of situations uh when well, i do not have done much of a research on that subject uh because it's very trans uh, specific uh, subject however uh, in my little understanding and uh, little observation of the community i i see that uh, if it is done uh, because there are people i know who really find it so uncomfortable living in their uh, body uh, with the sex assigned to them at the birth and they really wish to change that uh, so it should be allowed for sure with a proper uh, medical support and counseling uh, support provided to them uh, at the same time i think that there needs to be in a particular age in which you should be allowed to take such drastic decision in your life uh, because uh, when we see the western world in which people are doing such kind of surgeries when they are really like 12 years old 13 year old yeah you can't even create a tiktok account at that time and you are going on such surgeries on top of it you your parents are supporting you for that and then the over a period of time uh, they discovered that the decision they took at the age of 12 and 13 were wrong and they are terribly miserable today so there needs to be some kind of age i don't know what that age could be could be 15 could it be 17 could it be 18 can it be different for different countries uh, i think let the uh, more professional people who understand human psychology make that call but there needs to be some kind of age restrictions on it point number 1 Point number two is they should be allowed to do that uh, because um, I have seen people really uncomfortable with their uh, body and they wish to change it just to be comfortable in this life uh, with the gender they uh, want to live as. Uh, third is hormones again should be taken uh, under the guidance uh, of uh, professionals of that field. Uh, just taking uh, uh, injections of it, uh, which is quite prominent within community, unfortunately, should not be encouraged. Uh, again, most of the time it happens out of peer pressure that somebody you know within community is doing it, who also happens to become your supplier, and then you start taking it. And over a period of time, you also become that supplier and give it to somebody else who is a newbie to the community. Uh, so all of those things is quite dangerous. and then uh, unhealthy practices which should not be encouraged and should be stopped and more awareness needs to be created around it and you know there's some fundamental uh, to the earlier point that you were making there's a fundamental contradiction that you decide your sexual orientation at an age when you can't give sexual consent i mean <laughs> the, the starting point itself is so wrong that i mean when you can't consent how can you decide it's whether you forget about you know what even for a straight person you can't consent how can you decide you're straight i mean just taking that logic to another extent it's a sorry but uh, okay in terms of uh, dating and meeting people right these days even i mean straight people also <laughs> complain that they are struggling to meet partners the right match etc you know dating app culture is not really leading to people meeting anyone generally everybody is i mean the general uh, understanding is that people are just not able to meet the kind of people they want they are not happy so this situation i believe would be even more acute for people uh, you know from the que- uh, queer community so how i mean uh, what avenues are there for people to meet you know people they want to date or be in a relationship with yes there are online platforms for that uh, of course there are and then uh, if you're looking for something uh, which is uh, like you know very on a superficial level just for a hookup and uh, 
something non-permanent, nothing emotional. Uh, it's very easy. It's so quick, easily accessible with variety of options. Uh, I sometimes really feel like uh, opening up a queer uh, apps is just like uh, going to a candy store. Uh, where in the kind of flavors and the types you want, you get all of it within the uh, five to ten kilometers of radius of whichever part of the India you are in. So sometimes I jokingly really tell within the community when we friends are chilling and they say that hey, they call us minority, but are we really? Uh, because the uh, if you open Grinder, uh, even in the rural part of the country where you say oh my god, I'm the only one, and then ping. Uh, just a guy who is just like uh, say other uh, like you know five hundred meters away, uh, available to meet you right away, uh, and surprisingly he's with Prince. So uh, yeah, so jokes apart, uh, when it comes to uh, like very quick, uh, we don't need to do all this drama of taking people out on a coffee and three coffee, and after that you go on uh, some like, the question around who your place or my place comes in, no, no, nothing like that in the first three minutes of the chat itself uh, uh, right so that is very quick very practical uh, very accessible however when we talk about uh, something substantial something long term uh, something uh, which makes you fulfill uh, in life uh, that is difficult and why it is so and why the hookup is easy is because the taboo around being queer so you will find that over 80% of the people you happen to meet on these apps are the one who will at one stage of life will get married to the girl uh, their parents are going to find or they are already married and cheating on their partner. Right? Uh, because you really can't change yourself. What you are is you are. You of course can act uh, because of societal pressure, because of your parents' uh, uh, name and uh, you don't have courage to come out um, but uh, that is not something uh, which will give you the fulfillment so i always say this that uh, if you are somebody uh, happens to be from a queer community planning to get married uh, to the person of opposite gender because of your family pressure just ask this one simple question to yourself that if you had a sister Will you allow your sister to get married to somebody who is gay? If no, then who has given you the right to spoil the life of somebody else's sister? And that is something we need to reflect. Uh, so the the, the, uh, the dating scene within the queer community is very happening, very vibrant, but it is a non-emotional NSA kind of a thing. I actually saw a tweet that you had made, I think a month or two back where you were in Varanasi and you were uh, uh, very happy that you were talking something, some dharmic philosophy with someone on Grindr you met or something like that. I, I, I don't exactly remember, but you something on those lines, ki Varanasi mein aake, I meet someone on Grindr and I'm talking something related to dharma or something like that. I, I don't remember the yeah, exact uh, tweet to right now. now but, because of yeah. social media and... Uh trolling which happens of me i'm quite known as the hindu poster boy of queer community uh, so people who want to have uh, such conversation ping me so uh, yeah this happened with me when i go to vrindavan it happened to me when i was in kashi so in Pirthasthana, i have satsang on grinder i want to because you work with the un and this is also a little bit more macro beyond uh, you know queer issues as well uh, because activism usually happens via NGOs and usually that you know where it, that kind of activism veers and uh, sometimes it becomes a very reductionist narrative especially in international forums you know when it gets weaponized in a way which is not conducive for the cause and extremely bad for the country uh, many people actually even question the efficacy of the UN itself, uh, whether it is still an organization which is living in that post-World War II scenario, it doesn't even have India as a permanent member and all of that, right, of the Security Council and also in terms of the activist space itself. 
So, uh, what role do you see generally the United Nations? Do you think it is still relevant as it used to be? You know, what what do you think about the role of the UN as such? So, whenever I'm asked this question, that is UN relevant? I tell this short story, which a previous foreign minister of Russia uh, once told at the UN itself, and he's told that at the Garden of Eden. Um, one fine day, Adam and Eve were sitting, and Adam observed that Eve's interest in me has been decreasing in the past few time. So, after thinking a lot, finally, Adam found the courage to ask Eve that, "Hey, Eve, is there anyone else?" The story ends. The people who ask me this question, that is you and relevant, I ask counter question them that is there anyone else? 193 countries on this planet are able to somehow manage to meet each year and talk on the various con- topics which are concerning to our world. May not be immediate impactful conversation which you and me would be talking on daily news cycles, whether it's Russia-Ukraine war, whether it is uh, China's expansionism, or the West versus the East, or multipolar world, and all of that thing. Yes, UN has terribly failed on most of its founding uh, objectives. But yet, UN is able to feed millions of people through its mechanism and with the various bodies around the world. Even today, UN is able to provide humanitarian aid to so many people who are in acute need of food, water, and shelter. Even today, we are able to have a conversation on environment because you will exist, right? So uh, if you look at a lot of humanitarian issues uh, and issues concerned to the planet Earth, uh, we find that UN is the platform in which we are able to have the conversation. We may not be able to find the agreement on all of it. Of course, um, at, even at the UN, we bring our own national interest and rightfully so. Uh, to the table and that's why we are not able to find the solution to all the problems we as a humanity face. But yet again, let's assume that you dissolve UN tomorrow. Then what next? Are you having any better world vision without the UN? If you are able to give something which is much more tangible, much more productive, much more positive, then let's talk about dismantling UN. If no, Let's talk about how to make UN better than yesterday. UN is the terrible organization when it comes to reform. UN is the worst organization when it comes to producing the result. Because it's all like to talk about is the meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. But even despite all of its challenges, it is the only institute on the planet which has the membership of over 190 country on the planet. And that's why UN is relevant. So finally, uh, Ankit, what, uh, you know, because a lot of youngsters would be watching this and what advice would you give to young, you know, uh, LGBTQ Hindus who are uh, struggling to reconcile their sexuality or their gender identity with their faith and culture? Look, in Sanatan Parampara, we have a conversation of Aranya, jungle, and Grama, Sanskriti. Okay? So, nature, Prakriti, Aranya, jungle, and Sanskriti is household. To get enlightened, most of the people go from household to forest, from Grama to Aranya, and they get enlightened. What does it mean? It means that things you can't see in culture, you find that in nature. By being closer to nature, your worldview expands. And once you get enlightened, you come back and bring those learnings and teaching back to Sanskriti. So it is a cycle. Sanskriti get nourished by Prakriti and Prakriti get nourished by Sanskriti. When? We live in our own limited world. We think that is the only world which exists. 
बट सनातन से अगर ज्ञान चाहिए तो अपने आंखों को खोलो दर्शन करो एक्सपांड योर विजन गो टू अरण्य सी द नेचर नेचर इज डाइवर्स नाउ टेक लेसन फ्रॉम इट गो बैक टू योर संस्कृति एंड स्ट्रेंथन योर संस्कृति सो क्वेरनेस एग्जिस्ट इन नेचर कैन यू हैव स्पेस फॉर दिस क्वेरनेस विद इन योर संस्कृति और नॉट इज द क्वेश्चन वी ऑल नीड टू रिफ्लेक्ट पेन मदर यशोदा आस लॉर्ड कृष्णा आफ्टर ईटिंग डर्ट दट ओपन योर माउथ एंड वेन कृष्णा ओपन इज माउथ मदर यशोदा सॉ द होल यूनिवर्स इन कृष्णाज माउथ माई क्वेश्चन टू पीपल इज दट डू यू थिंक वेन लॉर्ड कृष्णा ओपन इज माउथ एंड गिवन द दर्शन ऑफ द होल यूनिवर्स इन इज माउथ टू मदर यशोदा He would have added everybody, the living and non-living entity, the male and female, and the mountains and rivers and jungles and everything. Do you think he would have left out the queer people from that darshan? And if Krishna can include we queer people in his universal form, who are you to discriminate? I think that's a very wonderfully philosophical way to uh, end this conversation. I mean, it really hits home the point in a beautiful, succinct way. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the show, Ankit. It's been a fascinating chat, and it's been great to have you uh, on the show. Uh, hope it's been likewise for you as well. It was fascinating uh, to have this conversation with you. I really enjoyed last sixty, seventy minutes with you, and and uh, I hope. Uh, to see your channel grow so please subscribe like and all of that things which you are supposed to do in whichever platform you are listening to friends uh, because conversation like these are important samvad like this is important because samvad leads to something more than what we already know today and that expansion is the gnan that is the way of sanatan thank you for having me namaste to all thank you with that we come to the end of the show and uh, ankit has already said you should like comment share and subscribe see you around guys until next time always remember dharma rocks see you around